bit of a background about you, uh, about your story. Um, okay. Yeah. So <laughs> I have a, I have a, I have a big background. Um, geez, where do I even begin? So whew, growing up, I always, I always had my hopes and dreams set on becoming an Olympian. Like being an Olympian was something that I was going to do. And that was it. I was going to do whatever I could to become an Olympian. Um, but at the time I was actually a gymnast, a gymnast, and I was on the South African junior team um, in preparation for the London 2012 Olympics. And that was when I was like nine years old. Um, and then when I was 13 years old, no, actually I stopped gymnastics at, a, at about nine and then I started swimming. And uh, I literally started swimming because one of my best friends suggested that I start swimming so we could play more often in the afternoon. And I was totally down for that. And uh, before I knew it, like swimming started taking over like my whole entire life. And um, my friend at the time was an incredible swimmer and uh, I started beating her. And that's when I was like, hmm, maybe, maybe swimming is something I need to take a little bit more seriously. And um, I had just qualified to represent South Africa on my first national team. And that April, when I was 13 years old, my whole entire life changed. We went um, to the Val Dam with my family. And I was water skiing behind my dad's speedboat. And I fell into the water. And as my dad's boat came around, another speedboat just came out of nowhere and drove straight over me. So the propeller of the speedboat came in at my navel, which is like your belly button and left all the way at the clevis on my bum, which basically ripped my whole entire body in two. Um, and then my whole entire life just got completely shaken up. I had to learn how to walk again. I had to learn how to swim again. Um, and I basically had to learn how to function properly with only half of my body functioning properly. Um, so because of my accident, my quadriceps, my hip flexors, my abdominals, and my glutes, all on the left-hand side of my body were completely paralyzed. Because of the, the speed of the propeller, yeah. it ripped part of the sciatica nerve out of my spine, which feeds those muscles. So because it had been ripped out of the spine, they would never be able to function ever again. Yeah, you're, you're and um, really lucky to be alive and never to say uh, walk again or do anything. Right, right. I mean, I'm often astounded. Like it, it goes through long periods of time where I don't even speak about my accidents. And when I do speak about it, I'm just like, how are you even alive? N despite the fact that like God was gracious oh. enough to save my leg, the fact that I'm here to tell the story, it often just, it's crazy. It blows my mind. I mean, if I had to hear the story out of someone else's mouth, I would be, I would be shocked that they're alive, let alone yeah. it being myself. Yeah. yeah. Um, sure. And, uh, Not only that you uh, survive, you, um, whoever, uh, wants to know and interested uh, you went back eventually swimming pretty soon right and right yeah so i i went through about a two-year recovery phase um i was flat on my back in a hospital bed in traction for about seven months um and the reason why i was in traction was because the doctors didn't want my leg to grow back on being too long or too short um so yeah, after that, I had to learn how to walk again and I was adamant to get back into the water. I was adamant to prove to myself that I could make it back to the top as a professional swimmer. And uh, <laughs> the first time I got into the water, I got completely smashed and I, <laughs> I knew I had a lot of work, a lot of work in front of me. And uh, I started swimming again and I was in the, I was in the rehab center doing a lot of work to like put all of these pieces back together because my pelvis was in nine separate pieces. 
So that had to heal together. The only thing that kept my leg attached was like the inner skin inside of my groin. Um, so the propeller had cut through my whole entire pelvis and you've got your hip joint and then your leg that attaches into the joint and that had been completely detached. So I had to, I had to quickly learn and adjust if I wanted to make it back to the top. Aren't you scared? Um, like, aren't you scared at all about, like, saying, "Okay, I got it. Uh, I, I'm alive. Thank you, good enough for me. I don't mm -hmm. want uh, to, you know, uh, put myself in any danger or try to put myself in any damage, and just, you know, say, okay, 'Okay, I'm walking. That's it.' Like, weren't there like this mm -hmm. type of thoughts in your head or any doubts or anything? You know, it's it's, I often get asked that question and there was absolutely no doubt in me. There was no doubt. There was no anger. There was no fear. And that's also what you were saying about like being creative. Like you have to be brave to create something or to reinvent yourself. And I literally at 13 years old had to completely reinvent myself. Um, I had to make peace with the fact that I was now disabled. I had to make peace with the fact that most of my body was covered in scarring. And I mean, at 13 years old, girls are already going through a lot and already developing and learning about themselves. And I had to do all of that in like a very short um, amount of time. And then I had to focus on fighting for my life. Like I didn't have time to worry about all of the nitty gritty things that a teenager goes through. I had to literally snap out of it and go into survival mode and completely reinvent myself. Um, and I worked really, 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 really hard. And uh, I was in the rehab center. My physio at the rehab said to me, why don't you consider Paralympic swimming? And I was totally against it. I was like, there's absolutely no way I'm not disabled. And um, I was actually offended by it. <laughs> There's no way I'm going to be an Olympian. That's, that's it. And um, I swam my first race. And at my first race, I swam the 50 meter freestyle and I broke the South African record um, for Paralympics. And I was like, okay, that's pretty interesting. So then I was, uh, I completely, I completely just knew that my calling is not to be an Olympian, but to step into the role of being a Paralympian where I could be a role model and, and an example, not only for young girls, but for people in general, that no matter what happens, you can do it. Like you can put everything you've got into something and you can create something beautiful. And uh, it's so crazy. I had my, I had my, accident in April 2004 which was the year of the Athens Paralympics and four years later I represent my represented my country at the Beijing Paralympics and I walked away with a gold medal <laughs> Amazing, yeah yeah like it even it even makes me emotional because like sure I'm just so grateful that I was brave enough to do it yeah, you like, I'm trying to think about, um, I think most people will look back at any point in life and will say, ah, oh, I should have done this. And you know, this feeling of missing out and giving up on a dream or something. And you actually, you didn't. And you're, right. you have this amazing thing where you can remember, and get excited all over again and be so proud of yourself and uh, what you right. have uh, done and actually take that um, like take those uh, rubbles of the destruction or whatever and you build something uh, new from it and that's right. also something that is in common to a lot of people who've done uh, great things they, most of them had something uh, a radical happening somewhere yeah exactly and i like to compare it to a bow and arrow like 
when you're shooting a bow and arrow, you need to have that enormous amount of pullback, which is the negative space, to be able to launch into something great. And um, I'm so grateful that I endured during the pullback and I worked extremely, extremely hard um, to be able to reap the reward of what came afterwards. I mean, I became South Africa's youngest ever Olympic gold medalist um, at the age of 17. I was still in school, which was crazy. And uh, yeah, after that, I still went on to compete at two games, um, the London 2012 Olympics, where I got a bronze medal. And then I retired in Rio, which was, I wouldn't change it for a thing. I, I often get asked, like, if you could turn back the hands of time and if you could not have your accidents and live a completely normal life um, without your disability, without all of the scarring all over your body, um, would you do it? And I'm, I'm always like, there's no way. There's no way. I would relive everything a million times over just because it's molded me into a human being that I'm, oh, I'm so proud. I'm so proud to be. Yeah. yeah, I think I think through the whole process, I learned compassion. I learned love. I learned, oh, I learned so much that it's just irreplaceable. And yeah. um, I think every single every single human being is going to go through trials in their life. Maybe not to the extreme of what I had to go through at a young age, but in many different forms. Um, and if they just have the courage to endure and just go for it the reward is so much sweeter on the other side yeah i think there's like this uh again this common factor to all the people who i interviewed that actually made something great happen or are doing something that they're really proud and happy with they 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 are confident in in their mistakes, that meaning they they know that um, there is no perfect, and like you have to work to be perfect. But even if it's not, then it's okay. And uh, no matter what happens, as long as you uh, a lot of a lot of them also spoke about honesty and doing things from a real place. Mm. I think that's really difficult, also, because there is a lot of fear involved. If you're honest about whatever it is you want to do, it could be weird to some people. Some might just say, ah, now what, you know, you were a gymnastics, what now swimming? What now after that yeah. accident, you're going to try and swim in the Olympics? No, you know, do you, do you really need to look past those things? And be... Yeah. I think, I think the biggest downfall for people is definitely caring so much about what other people think. Um, it cages you in and it steals away your freedom. So, yeah, and it's it's also, it's true what you say, like operating from a place where you're completely authentic and or completely real, um, it's super important because then you're not really giving too much attention to what everyone else is going to think about you. Um, and that's going to make what you're doing and whatever you're trying to achieve or create completely authentic, completely real, and completely original. I think, yeah. So that's part of the thing that comes with success, because uh, that's something that people uh, people admire this uh, this quality, because most most people are scared to do something different or to uh, follow their dreams and leave their day job or do anything like that. Right. So once they see some someone who just do it they they relate they admire that quality they want to be that person you know, so. absolutely and i think um for me words are meaningless like you in order to change the world and to in order to inspire anyone to do anything differently you yourself have to show up in a certain way for them to see because only once they see it, are they going to learn from it? Like words, words, are, what's the point of trying to explain anything to anyone? Um, it's important to show them. 
mm -hmm. to show them that it's okay to be who you need to be and it's okay to step out of the comfort zone. Um, and by doing that, you are going to help a lot of people along the way. A lot of people. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You, you also have like this, uh, you're, you're also a journalist. So, do you have like this input uh, about creativity? If I am now to tell you, um, there's a different variety of people, uh, whether it's uh, a computer engineer or an artist with a writing block or just someone who wants to try and think creative about a problem or just for themselves. Um, do you have like this? Uh, tip or something you would want to say to them? Hmm. I think the most important thing is to follow your bliss. To follow your bliss and to do exactly what you want to do. Um, once you step into that space where you are operating from stuff that makes you happy and inspires you, first and foremost, like forget about what you think people would want. First, uh, bring yourself into a place to understand what it is that you want. And from there, you're going to be able to create something absolutely beautiful. So, for example, my bliss is definitely health and fitness, um, self-development. And the more I educate myself on what it means to fuel your body with amazing nutrients and what it means to love yourself and take care of yourself that's me following my bliss and from that space i can be creative like if you put me into a space where i need to start writing about politics or about business economics i will not create anything truly beautiful because it's not something that makes me happy And it won't be coming from an authentic place. It will be me literally completing a job that just needs to be done. Whereas on the other side of it, if I'm writing about health and fitness, I can fully immerse myself in the subject. So yeah, I just think to definitely first and foremost, follow things that truly, truly, truly set you on fire and make you happy. That's the most important. Yeah, no, I think a lot of people are also uh, looking for those things. You know, a lot of people haven't searched. Uh, you know, again, another thing in common uh, is uh, people who are uh, creative or uh, doing something creative or something uh, fulfilling in their lives, they, uh, they kind of lost the, the trail of thought, I was going to say. They, Uh, know um, themselves to a point where they actually search and ask themselves some serious questions, you know? Uh, right. And that's also and something I, that relates to fear. Not everyone are willing to ask themselves certain questions. Right. And that's the thing. Like, so many people are extremely fearful of understanding the power and the amazingness that they already hold inside yeah um and i think that's also people are surrounded by noise and when i refer to noise i refer to social media television um anything to block out them from having to look within and that's that's the, that's the key that's the key once you spend time quietening out all this noise and you actually start asking yourself these very important questions like what is my truth what is my bliss what what is it that i want they'll be astounded at the results that they come to and i think the people that are the most successful in creativity um have spent a lot of time by themselves and i am so privileged that from a very young age i i, I had to do that i had absolutely no other option Yeah. I had to go within and to ask myself, what is it that I need in order to achieve this thing that I've set in front of myself? And uh, yeah, to spend time with yourself and start asking yourself those serious, serious, serious questions. Yeah. 
because again, the, that place, again, most people are so afraid of asking themselves those questions. I don't know, I'm not sure why, but there is uh, all this, like reality today is really easy if you're not looking to ask yourself any questions. You can literally go through all the isolation of Corona and have no insights whatsoever. Like there's Netflix, there's uh, TV, there's news, there's computer, there's mobile devices. Exactly. That's why I think like at, at this specific time, um, everyone are a bit more available. And if anyone will just try and take some time from that, mm -hmm. all that extra time that we have now, think with themselves about their direction about uh, if they want to enrich themselves with uh, creativity which is for me anything new so yeah it's an amazing time to do it and uh, yeah and that also comes down to the discipline that i was talking about like people aren't even disciplined enough to just spend time with themselves um because it's so easy to go and switch on the TV and watch like a hundred movies one after the other. And it takes discipline to switch the TV off and to sit by yourself and actually write down some goals or to write down the things that are bothering in your life and to come up with solutions. It takes, it takes effort. It takes effort. Um, and my wish is for people to just put the work into themselves and to understand that they are beings of light and beings of love. And they're going to discover magic, pure magic. Yeah. I guess, yeah, everyone owes it to themselves to know themselves a bit more and uh, definitely love themselves and appreciate themselves a bit more. Um, do you have like this um, ritual or had a ritual or specific things you do besides practice whenever you had this uh, competition or something important that you need to do? Sure. When I was competing, I feel like I competed such a long time ago. I quickly have to search my mind to remember what I used to do. Um, did I have a ritual? Sure, I don't think I had a ritual. Uh, I think I, I think I literally just used to switch over into like autopilot, where I just used to do exactly what needed to be do, what needed to be done. Um, my diet was always pretty, pretty, pretty much the same. Um, when I competed, I wouldn't eat very heavy food, so I, I used to avoid red meat. Um, obviously processed food, obviously no alcohol. Um, yeah, so I think that was like a major part of my ritual to know that my body is clean so that my energy can flow completely so that I don't fatigue. Um, and I think that's also why I'm so passionate about health and fitness now is because throughout my swimming career, I saw that by putting junk into the body, I'm not going to be able to compete optimally. And um, it's just something that's transpired into my everyday life. Like even today, I know when I'm going to be eating bad things, I'm just sluggish, I'm tired. I, I don't put the work into myself that needs to be done. I don't go to the gym. So yeah, I think my ritual was very much based around what goes into the body. It was just constant. Like it wasn't this one thing, especially it was just all the time yeah yeah it was just a constant like i know a lot of athletes have this ritual um thing that they need to follow <laughs> to get their mind to switch over into whatever they're going to do but i don't think mine was i think mine was just complete focus and attention to what needs to be executed and needed to be done um and i wouldn't allow myself to get distracted from that even one bit so just kind of like a tunnel vision um how do you practice this uh, discipline? Like, how do you come to a point where you have this level of discipline to train at such a young age, uh, in such a high level, with all those difficulties? Again, it could be 
uh, very easy to say, okay, screw it, I'm just gonna uh, pass time until I feel better and uh, live a normal life. Like, how do you could just mm -hmm. uh, with such high discipline? Where, where's the motivation? I think I think a major part of was a part of it was I knew exactly what I wanted, um, and and not a lot of people know what they want. Um, and even even at such a young age, I knew that I wanted to be an Olympian, and I knew that that was going to require a large amount of effort. Um, so yeah, I think that's where the discipline came in, and um, discipline is also something that's a habit. Once you once you practice being disciplined, after a while, you don't need to practice it anymore because it just becomes part of your being. Um, so just to enforce that habit. Is what makes you disciplined and like i said eventually it becomes effortless eventually it just becomes part of what you are and what you do and um there's just no going around it or changing it it becomes completely effortless yeah so the pra practice 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 it's like even someone that's addicted to sugar yeah like if you can get into the habit of not eating sugar and you can program that into the subconscious mind within 21 days, you are not even going to be thinking about sugar. And therefore afterwards, not eating sugar becomes completely effortless. So it's all about basing yourself on habits and, um, just being disciplined enough for that short period of time where it just gets engraved into who you are and then it becomes effortless. Yeah. Yeah. So you have to work really hard for not such a long time for you to have like an easier time down the road, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I spent, I started swimming from the age of nine and I retired at the age of 25 and every single morning I was up at four o'clock in the morning to be in the swimming pool at five. And it's, it becomes effortless. Like it's just part of what you do. It doesn't require discipline anymore. <laughs> well, it does, it does, but it, it just becomes a lot easier. Yeah. You're, you're just doing it as, um, a subconscious action you don't think about okay i need to you know that you need to do this so you just go exactly it's like it's like driving a car like when you are driving a car you're not thinking about how to turn the steering wheel or how to change a gear or how to push the petrol you have done it so many times that subconsciously it just becomes effortless